I work uh, for HashiCorp uh, as part of the Terraform team, maintaining mainly the provider land, mostly AWS, but I also build the Kubernetes provider. So quick show of hands, how many of you use Kubernetes? OK. It's not as many as I expected. Uh, anyone in production? Okay, it's about the same amount. Uh, is there anyone who uses the Kubernetes, the Kubernetes Terraform provider already? Wow. Thank you. That's quite early. Um, so managing the Kubernetes cluster, to me, uh, really means managing a few different layers. So let me decompose the whole thing into three layers. First of all, you need some kind of base infrastructure, or what I call base infrastructure. Uh, depends on where you run. Uh, if you have bare metal, that's IPXC, VMware, uh, you know, Amazon EC2, Google Cloud, GCE. And uh, once you have that, once you build that, you uh, get to expose uh, some kind of interface to the next layer. That interface typically consists of a, your favorite flavor of Linux. And um, then you get to the next stage, to the next layer, which is configuration management. That part is typically handled by tools like Puppet, Chef, or Ansible. Uh, and it involves, in the Kubernetes world, it involves uh, things like etcd, uh, setting up the API server, installing Kubernetes, uh, setting up CA certs, uh, et cetera. And uh, finally, once you do that, uh, you get to the last layer, and that's the Kubernetes API, where you can schedule or configure config maps, uh, schedule pods, replication controllers, and generally, uh, Kubernetes resources. So uh, since the 0 0.9 point something or 0 0.10, there is the Kubernetes provider, which covers the top layer mainly. So that's what we're going to be talking about in this talk. Uh, you can certainly use Terraform uh, to manage the, the lower layer, uh, but uh, that's been always the case. So quick disclaimer. Um, this talk is not supposed to convince you that Terraform is the only way to manage your Kubernetes resources, because every company has different needs and workflows. So keep that in mind. And um, kind of read that as there is no silver bullet. And uh, I'll try to describe contexts in which this provider may be useful to you. So just a brief outline of what we're going to cover in this talk. Firstly, I'm going to have a look into HCL, why HCL uh, may be uh, useful to you, uh, the nature of workload that uh, would be good to run through this provider, why synchronicity uh, may work in your benefits, um, why full lifecycle coverage is important, and um, after covering the overlap of responsibilities between Kubernetes and Terraform, uh, we're hopefully going to get to demo. So HCL, um, or so-called HashiCorp config language, uh, unless uh, you uh, manage your resources manually, um, which usually doesn't scale, if you're not using Terraform, uh, you would be building your own scripts. And that means you would be using some kind of high-level language, uh, for example, Python or Go. And uh, those languages are amazing. They uh, you know, offer you a lot of different ways to shoot yourselves in the foot, like uh, classes, functions, and loops, and uh, all kinds of things. And um, on the other side, you have languages for data, which uh, typically include JSON or YAML. Um, and these languages lack these features. So they were designed to transfer data, obviously, uh, but which is usually good for describing infrastructure. But th the trouble is that they also lack features which you may find useful, like referencing um, or comments, for example. So despite that designing a DSL is a challenge, it's a huge challenge, 
um, Terraform and Puppet has chosen to to this path, basically. So HCL is a separate project, which you can find on GitHub. And um, it is used in various GitHub uh, HashiCorp projects, like Console, Vault, Nomad, or Terraform. Now, uh, it is also JSON compatible, uh, which you may find useful for generated code. And you may ask yourselves, why generated code? Why would you generate the code? Um, so here's an example. Um, the GDS, which is the government digital service in the UK, uh, has this project where they take advantage of, uh, of this feature by having bind zone files for their DNS. And uh, they translate that into JSON and hand it over to Terraform, uh, which can then create their DNS records in GCP, Dyn DNS, and uh, root 53. Now, coming up, workload nature. What kind of Kubernetes workload is best managed uh, via Terraform? Uh, so at the moment, we support these kind of resources. So there's three, 13 resources in total and two data sources, which uh, is mostly the V1 coverage. Um, and those from out of the V1, those which kind of make sense to support in Terraform. So you won't find things like nodes in there. And um, it is, uh, there is a bunch of resources which uh, are kind of ops focused, uh, which are these basically, config maps, uh, limit ranges, resource quotas, secrets, namespaces, service accounts. And uh, those are the ones that operators are likely going to uh, use. And uh, operators are usually those who are already familiar with Terraform. And they are already responsible for bringing up the cluster anyway. Uh, so this is, this is a great fit for, for the provider. Then we have what I call workload resources. Um, we have a pod, which for those of you who are not familiar with Kubernetes, uh, pod is a collection of containers scheduled together and kept it alive uh, by Kubernetes. Then we have replication controller, which basically replicates those pods for resiliency purposes. And we have uh, horizontal pod autoscaler, which scales pods in a given replication controller, usually based on consumed CPU. And finally, service allows you to expose pods out to the user. And uh, while you could, um, Generally, a good use case for using these resources is uh, for shared services, like monitoring or logging, anything that is shared within your company, within your teams. Why? Well, because Kubernetes has this concept of admission controllers, uh, which is a controller that sits in Kubernetes and can intercept any of your requests. Uh, for uh, creation of any resource, and it can modify the, uh, the the resource that you're submitting and give you back a different uh, different thing, basically. And as an operator, you are uh, more likely to be familiar with those admission controllers, which are in place. Um, that may affect the conflict, um, or may cause the conflict. Uh, so that's why I'm suggesting that you should use these as an operator, because as a developer, you might not be aware of these admission controllers, and uh, they would uh, cause troubles. So synchronicity. Kubernetes API is designed to be asynchronous, which enables scalability. That's great, right? Uh, and um, Kubernetes always expects you to be proactive. Uh, about asking whether an operation has finished or failed, at least initially. And um, not all failures are retriable, though. So let's uh, look behind the scenes for a moment. We have a pod here uh, at, the, at the top. Let's see if I can use this. At the top, we have uh, the name of the pod, and we have a spec uh, which says what image um, what image uh, do we want to launch and download from Docker Hub, uh, and then name of the container. 
Now, the trouble is that what ha really happens behind the scenes, even though this is a declarative language, what happens behind the scenes is that Docker needs, uh, Kubernetes needs to ask Docker to pull down the image and start the container. And uh, a single container failing because of lack of capacity in the cluster probably doesn't matter, unless it's the only one. Uh, so this is how you can create a pod using uh, the kubectl. Uh, you have some kind of YAML config. And uh, basically, as I said, you have to be proactive about asking whether an operation has finished or failed. So you would use this kubectl pod, my pod, and ask uh, what for the status. And uh, if it has failed, you have to go to the events log to see what caused the failure. In this case, it's just a typo, right? So um, in, case of, uh, in case of Terraform, uh, you get to see uh, the error message that we pull out of the event log. So if you do make a typo, uh, you get to see the failure after a while, because obviously we expect things to fail sometimes. Uh, but that's why there is the timeout. Uh, so this is how you create a service via kubectl. You get to submit the service. Then you ask for the service, whether it's been, uh, you know, whether it, it was able to actually get the external IP and provision the load balancer or whatever. And then if it has failed, because it may fail for various reasons, one of them being that you reached your quota on GCP, for example, which is typically uh, something that's not retriable. Like, you're not going uh, to get through until you actually bump the limit. And once you do bump the limit, you still need to wait until Kubernetes uh, creates the load balancer and gives you the external IP, which you can then uh, reference elsewhere if need be for example, in a DNS record. A service in Terraform can be defined like this. Uh, here is, again, the name of the service. Uh, here is a selector, which basically says where to direct the traffic uh, from the service to which pod, uh, based on the label. And then uh, we have the port forwarding here. It says from which port to which port to, to direct. Um, the traffic, and then the type load balancer means that it's, it's going to provision a load balancer. And um, here you can reference the load balancer uh, once it is created in a Amazon root 53 DNS record. Now, uh, what happens if a service creation fails in Terraform? So first, uh, we hit Terraform apply. And we wait for a moment to see if the load balancer was finished, uh, was f successfully created. And uh, we get this error. Again, it's pulled off the, um, it queries the event log to see what's, what's, what's there and what's the last warning or what's the last error uh, to give you that context. Now, in case of successful, uh, creation in case you have a config that just makes sense and works and you didn't reach any of your quotas or anything, uh, it can wait until the load balancer is successfully created and therefore it has the IP address which it, which it may use in the DNS record later on. And as you can also see, it knows that the service needs to be created first before the DNS record. Um, so it's taking advantage of um, of the DAC, of the, DAC, uh, the of the of the graph, basically in in Terraform. So depending on uh, your way of thinking in the company, and uh, like whether you want to be proactive and keep checking for the status, and depending on your workflows and team responsibilities, synchronicity may or may not be uh, what you're looking for. Uh, so uh, just keep that in mind. Now, up to full lifecycle coverage. Why covering the whole lifecycle is, is, is important? Well, 
because every app will eventually be decommissioned. It's not done until it's decommissioned, right? Um, so many folks believe that the initial creation is the only step to production, but reality usually differs. Uh, you actually need to, you need to create the app first, and then uh, after a while you need to update it as well, and eventually you need to delete it. And um, while Terraform, uh, with Terraform you can basically use the same command, uh, and it will figure out based on the config uh, what what to do. So you can build a whole pipeline where you have the version controlled code, and it goes through the same apply command and enables you to, to do continuous delivery. Uh, that said, it's always advisable to review the plan uh, before making changes. So looking at the whole life cycle here uh, of a resource, uh, we get to create the resource, uh, we update it, delete it, and sometimes we need to recreate the resource. And whether the resource is updatable or not often depends on a field. So um, just to, again, to give you a brief uh, explanation, service is, again, something that allows you to expose a pod uh, to the user through an IP or a load balancer. And here in this config, not every field is actually mutable. So you can't update everything straight away. And uh, in order to know that, one has to read the docs very carefully or hope for the best. So that's um, why it's useful to use Terraform, uh, where you can see from the plan clearly that uh, the selector is an updatable field. And the plan will tell me that uh, I can update it and the operation should not be disrupted. Then if I decide to change the cluster IP, that's a field that's not updatable, so that will be reflected in the plan again. Uh, coming up to uh, responsibility overlap. So where we draw the lines between Kubernetes and Terraform. Uh, there are four main areas, which I would like to point out, uh, where you may see the overlap. And um, it's good to know these areas uh, because even though with the Kubernetes provider, because you can do something doesn't always mean you should, like the fact that we allow you to do certain things. Um, annotations, uh, Terraform's expectation is always that what you submit to the API is what you get back so that we can you know, generate the diff, et cetera. And at the very least, it, it's clear what aspect or what field of the resource may change over time so that we can ignore it. That's not the case for Terraform, uh, for Kubernetes annotations. Uh, what, what I mean by those is the annotation that has this host name in there. In Kubernetes, these can be used to enable alpha or beta features, but they can also be attached by the user to resources um, sorry, by, by the Kubernetes, the resources to enrich, um, enrich uh, the resource in a way that like, you can see what region or zone is it running in. Uh, so it, it, you know, there is no clear line between user-defined and Kubernetes-managed annotations, which is why we ignore them at the moment. That said, uh, there is obviously demand uh, for for managing those annotations, so it's, it's, it's a decision that needs revisiting. Um, now, uh, coming up, workload. Uh, that's another sort of overlapping uh, context. You can use Terraform to schedule a pod, and then Kubernetes is responsible for uh, keeping those containers within the pod up, and that's not, you know, that has nothing to do with, with Terraform. In this case, Terraform can, however, provide you the initial feedback. For example, a container has failed to start because you just made a typo in the, in, in the tag or in the image. Uh, 
Uh, next example is replication controller. So we are just moving up uh, in case you manage the replication controller, controller through Terraform, then Kubernetes is then responsible for managing the pods, which are within that replication controller. And then pod obviously manages containers. Um, so in this case, Terraform doesn't see inside the pod, and it wouldn't even make sense uh, to deal with pod failures on this level because you know failures are just expected at that level. Uh, if you have even more dynamic application, uh, you're going to use Pod Autoscaler. And um, here is a bit of an overlap um, because Terraform needs to create the autoscaler, uh, which defines uh, minimum and maximum number of, of replicas. And it also needs to create the replication controller, which defines the initial number of replicas, uh, which will then be managed by the autoscaler. Uh, so in this case, uh, Kubernetes will obviously manage, manage the pods and the containers, uh, but you need to deal with the, with the overlap. And this is one way of dealing with the overlap, where you can specify the lifecycle block here. And in the lifecycle block, you get to this ignore changes, uh, where you can say, please, Terraform, just ignore any changes that will happen outside of my control. Uh, i.e. by the autoscaler uh, in this field. So you won't get to see the diff for this field. And it will prevent you just to, it will prevent the conflict. Now, uh, storage. Volumes can obviously always be managed by Terraform. Uh, by volumes, I mean EBS or Google Cloud persistent storage, but it depends on your workflow and trust between your developers and operators. Uh, it's quite common that people who run Kubernetes are a bit more relaxed in these relationships and a bit more flexible, and they also demand uh, very easy scalability. So uh, you would, in this case, you would more likely let the storage class uh, be managed by Kubernetes and uh, by Terraform, and then uh, Kubernetes would manage, uh, would provision these volumes for you. And you can do the same with uh, persistent volume, and the same with persistent volume claim, because the API is obviously complex, so there is a lot of ways to do the same thing, or even pod, which can be a standalone pod or scheduled as part of the replication controller. Now, coming up, service. Um, in Terraform, you can obviously um, manage your load balancers directly and turn all the knobs, all the fields directly. But that won't be very convenient if you have a more dynamic workload in Kubernetes, where services just come up and go away often. And, um, or in case your load balancers just get uh, some dynamic IPs assigned or dynamic host names. In which case, it's just better to let Terraform manage the service, and let Kubernetes provision the load balancers. So we are quite ahead of time, and it's time for demo. Yay. Let's see. All right. Can everyone see that at the back? Yeah, cool. All right, so we have, actually, let me switch the slides for, for a quick moment. So we're going to have two personas in this demo. We have developer Bob and uh, operator Alice. And in the first demo, we're going to deploy a who's, who's on call app, which, gonna involve, uh, which is going to involve Minikube, uh, which is like a small version of Kubernetes that you can run on your laptop in VirtualBox. And that will also involve replication controller and, uh, and the service. So let's see. What do we have? Oops. So we have got this config here. And we have the replication controller, uh, the spec, 
we have a special image um, name for for the container, and then we also have resource limits specified, which mean how much uh, CPU and memory we can go up to, and how much do we request. And then we have the service, which will expose this uh, this app to to our users. And you can see that we take advantage of uh, of the referencing here. And then we finally output the, the name of the service, again, by referencing the service, uh, because that's just handy. So let's see. I just Let me just verify that Minikube is actually running. OK, that's running. Now, uh, let me see if kubectl can reach it. That's fine. So first thing I'm going to do is run Terraform init, which uh, would normally download the Kubernetes plugin, but since I have it compiled locally, it didn't really do anything. Now I can run Terraform plan, which uh, tells me you're going to create two resources. And I get to see all the defaults and fields that are going to be computed. So now, since I'm happy with that, I run Terraform apply. Now that's done. And um, I can use this nice Minikube feature, Minikube service. Uh, and I can leverage the output from Terraform. And yay. You know, obviously, in the, in the, this is just the first iteration, you know. Maybe the next iteration, we can just connect it to PageDuty or something. But just, you know, we will get there eventually. So um, next up is uh, our operator, Alice. So Alice, uh, because she's an operator, she just decided to go with the GKE. She's going to deploy a GKE cluster, and she's going to create a namespace. Namespace in Kubernetes uh, allows you to scope uh, your, uh, for example, limits, resource quotas, and generally scope down um, the resources. And she's also going to create a limit range. So let's see. What do we got? So we have the container cluster. We are leveraging the Google Cloud uh, provider here. Um, give it a badass name. And, um, and we generate, uh, we use the random provider to generate the user and the password and give it some OAuth scopes. I actually uh, created this cluster before because creating the cluster takes about three minutes at least. and uh, Despite the fact that I like just watching stuff in the console, I thought you might not be like me. Uh, so then, since we have the cluster up and running, um, actually, let me let me do one thing. I need this. G cloud command to get the credentials for the cluster and see. Oops. Yeah, that's fine. So we should have access to the cluster now. Just to verify. Yay. We do. And that means Alice can create the namespace here. We just specify the name of the namespace and uh, the limit range, which basically limits um, the amount of CPU that a single pod uh, and the amount of memory that a single pod can consume within the namespace. So again, I run Terraform init and plan. Plan tells me that I'm going to create two resources. 
which is exactly what I intend to do. So I go ahead. And this was actually, f oh yeah, that was fast as expected. And uh, there is not much to see in, on the web, obviously. So let's go to the third part of the demo. And um, that is production. So Bob and Alice came together. We sat, sat together and they said, why don't we just put this into production? And they saw their configs and, you know, this config uh, for this one has this provider block which defines how to connect to Kubernetes. And um, here we specify the config context which says connect to Minikube. And then uh, in case of Alice, she connects to the GKE cluster. Now the nice thing is that you can use Terraform workspace uh, to uh, have the same config and talk to both clusters. So here is an example of, uh, of doing that. Even though you might not be using workspaces, you actually are, uh, because by default you get a default workspace. So um, in this case, we say if the workspace is default, just use Minikube, talk to Minikube. Otherwise, talk to GKE. The other difference that we need to reflect in uh, production in this case is uh, the type of the service that we are deploying. Because on Minikube, we can use the node port, which means the uh, service just uh, exposes uh, uh, just sets, sets up the port forwarding within the context of the node, uh, but that's not quite helpful in case of uh, in case of GKE, because in GKE uh, you want the load balancer to be to be provisioned. That's a much more uh, scalable way to do this. So let's see. Terraform init plan, and since we are uh, we have the service, we have the node port because we are deploying to Minikube. And that's done. So we can use Minikube uh, you know, service and can do this, uh, eventually uh, if I change my um, context. Like that. It still works. I'm still on call. And um, then we get uh, to switch the workspace. So let's say we want to create a new workspace called Prot. And we also switch to the workspace immediately. Now, if I run Terraform, um, First I init. If I run Terraform plan, you can see that there are two new resources to be created. And that's because the, the workspace allows you to separate out and isolate out the, the state. And this part is going to take approximately one minute uh, because in this case we are uh, letting Kubernetes provision the load balancer. So uh, I'll just let that go through, and we can uh, come back to it. So in the meantime, I'm going to talk a bit about alpha and beta resources, which you might not have seen on, on the screenshot from the, from, uh, from the website. So the Kubernetes, as I said, currently supports all, v all V1 resources as of Kubernetes 1.6. And we have received many requests for alpha or beta resources, like um, deployment or ingress. And the problem with alpha or beta is the potential for breaking API changes uh, and how, like, how do we deal with those without impacting the Terraform and Terraform user too much. And so I'm aware that you know Google and the Kubernetes community 
and maybe other communities perceive alpha or beta slightly differently to others. And the API, APIs remain in that stage for quite a long time. Uh, so I totally respect that, and I'm actually appreci I, I appreciate that they are so upfront. Um, and uh, the Google team working on the Google provider um, kind of came up with a, with a good solution in that area, because the Google provider is also affected by this. And uh, I'll probably apply that solution in this uh, Kubernetes provider, too, eventually. So uh, before we wrap up, let's see if this has finished. Yay, it has finished. You can just click on the IP. And yay. And so to wrap up, keep a few things in mind. There's a few things to, to remember from this talk. Use DSL to your advantage. And um, use the workload resources mainly for ops-focused workload. So it is very much ops-focused provider. And be careful about running uh, the application workload through it, especially if, uh, if you use the admission controllers. Think about your culture and workflows first before picking a solution. And be aware of who owns the resource in Kubernetes. And try to avoid overlap if you can. Thank you.